There have been times when we have agreed to disagree. I have gone to another room and we check back again in 90 minutes or a couple of hours after I finished that chapter in the book and she finishes doing whatever she's doing over on the other side of the house. Having a big house helps. It helps a lot. I can go to the lower level, got it on TV and a little futon, put my feet up, watch a basketball game, let it, let it chill, let it cool out and then hook back up for dinner that night. It's not perfect. Your prayers are welcome. Cole Astaire asking, Perhaps you could make a few comments on how you and your spouses, it's directed to both of us, John, keep politics from affecting your romantic lives. I don't know much about John's family, but I know that Glenn's wife seems to disagree with him. How do you make that work? Well, Cole, Esther, you perceive correctly that my wife and I don't agree about a lot of stuff. My lovely wife, Lawan, who has made cameo appearances here at the Glenn Show and with whom John had, uh, has enjoyed uh, a pleasurable company. Many times, yeah. Uh, is a, a Bernie Sanders Democrat. And worse than that, she's a news junkie Bernie Sanders Democrat who stays on top of all the podcasts and all of the critical articles, co articles coming out about this, that, or the other, and is constantly challenging me on stuff that I say on The Glenn Show. And actually... I don't know how many of these uh, episodes between me and John that she's actually watched uh, from from front to back. I think she probably gets halfway through and it turns her stomach so much mm -hmm. that she can't can't bear to hear it out. How do we manage? With great difficulty, Cole is there with great difficulty. Um, I, I, I actually haven't thought systematically about what the the guidebook is uh, for negotiating. Uh, this, uh, these uh, treacherous waters. Uh, I'll, but I'll say a few things. One is we never go to bed mad at each other. Th that's, that's, that's a rule. We don't, we don't, you know, we have the snit. Sometimes we have the snit. I can't believe you said that. Haven't you read this? And then the feedback is, oh, you don't respect me. You think I'm not reading. You think I'm not informed. You think you're the only person who knows something because you're a professor, blah, blah, blah. He's a jackass. This is a politician that I like that she's referring to as a jackass. OK, not Donald Trump, not Donald Trump. Anyway, or you're always talking about cancel culture. Why don't you talk about the minimum wage? I don't hear you talking about the minimum wage, bread and butter issues. These are fish in a barrel that you're shooting, all the stupid stuff that these kids are doing on the college campuses. Blah, 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 blah. Or, or, or I'll say something like, you know, Cardi B with that WAP stuff. Uh, I, I get it. I, I get why you can't take your eyeball off of the rotating buttocks, but really it's not art and it's not good for our kids. And it wants to be somehow criticized, even as we accept the fact that there's a first amendment and blah, 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 blah. And she will say, what decade were you born in again? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. We try not to hold a grudge. That's one thing. We try not to bite our tongues, however. I, I think that's very bad. I think developing the habit of simply suppressing the disagreement because you anticipate that it's going to be unpleasant and you nod and go along and then you hold a resentment within yourself, feeling bullied by the fact that you can't express your opinion without getting an earful uh, is unhealthy. There's a kind of passive aggressive negativity that's embedded within that because you're now a victim of the fact that you can't speak your mind freely without anticipating that it's going to elicit some kind of negative response. Another thing that I'll say, the question is, uh, how do you manage with the disagreement not to ruin your romantic uh, lives? Another thing I'll say is we listen, or at least I try to be very careful about this, not shutting myself down in the middle of the second sentence of the argument that she's making because I know where it's going and I know that I disagree with it, but try to listen. Try to be generous. Where I can agree, I agree. Man, believe me, I agree, I agree. I send, sit over to you. See, I saw this. This is exactly the argument you were making the other day and I think this person is right. I send that kind of note uh, weekly uh, on where I can find agreement, where I can find affirmation. Agree. But of course, we have to have something other than politics to talk about. I mean, it can't just be argument. And so there is a wide sphere of uh, areas of mutual interest that uh, we can somehow repair to. But I, I will, I'll confess, 
uh, it is it is uh, troubling sometimes uh, the tensions that bu bubble up to the surface uh, between us, and we have to be careful. We have to be mindful. Gratuitous offense, gratuitous affront, uh, sarcasm, uh, uh, passive aggressive uh, self pity. Uh, these are things one can become more aware of in oneself and one can try to work to stifle them down. Sometimes saying nothing at all is the best uh, reaction, especially if you can feel yourself uh, going into one of those uh, darker places of, uh, of uh, you know, anger, self-pity uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, so, and you know, there have been times when we have agreed to disagree. I have gone to another room and uh, we check back again in 90 minutes or a couple of hours after I finished that chapter in the book and she finishes, uh, you know, doing whatever she's doing over on the other side of the house. Help, having a big house helps. It helps a lot. I can go to the lower level. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got a pool table down there, you know, got a little TV and a little futon, put my feet up, watch a basketball game, let it, let it chill, let it cool out, uh, and then hook back up for dinner that night. It's not perfect. And, I, you know, we've only been married three plus years. So, you know, your prayers are welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John, you got anything to say to Cole on this question? Um, not, as, not as much as you. Um, I guess this is the first time I've said on our show that um, two falls ago, my ex-wife and I split, actually. And so I've been a single dad since then. This was about six months before the lockdown happened. And I would say on that subject that um, she is very intelligent, very educated, and a great person, but she's further to the left than I am. And she, I don't think she would have any argument with my saying that she is, is woker than I am. And I don't mean excessively woke, but she is woker than I am. And I think she would have much less of a problem with the development since last summer than I do. And later in our marriage, I was beginning to notice a certain divergence between us in terms of my feelings about, you know, various things that, you know, going on in the media, various ideological currents and hers. And it was beginning to even affect what kind of company we, 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 we preferred to keep. And this was not officially why our marriage ended. However, I would say that I am glad that if it had to end, it was over by what happened last summer and what's happened since, because I can imagine conversations would have gotten a little awkward, kind of like what you're describing. And, you know, my living space is fairly big, but we have two small kids and it would have been harder to stay away from each other. And um, yeah, I would say that, um, She's a great person. There were great things about our marriage, but I find it hard to in myself now moving on with someone who wasn't in basic agreement with my skepticism of a lot of these modern developments. And I guess it's partly just that you continue changing and developing as you go through life. And I'm at a point here in my, you know, middle, middle age where I am quite I have quite a strong sense of myself with a capital S as being someone who has certain commitments and those commitments include pushing back against the excesses of what is now being called wokeness. You know, some people think we're against woke. I think of myself as thoroughly woke. My issue is wokeness that's mean. And to the idea that all of these things going on are somehow permissible, that it's inevitable excess that we should just look upon and click our tongues not that my ex ever said anything like this but a hypothetical person who would that wouldn't work for me i need to come talk about you know making dinner and watching the basketball game although in my case it would be an old movie or something like that i would need to do those things with somebody who was not put off by my not feeling the way the new york times op-ed page felt about something at this point i would not want to have to build bridges about things like that. So yeah, that's an that's an interesting thing. When I've started thinking about, okay, I'm gonna I'm out there. Who's it gonna be? I thought, well, it's limited partly 
because I've got to be with somebody who gets why I would write a book like The Elect. So that is my answer to that question to Mr. Cole Astaire. Talk about an old movie. That's a <laughs> that's a great name. Sounds like a character. In an I old see. Movie. So, yeah. Yeah, Cole Porter and Fred Astaire is what you're thinking about. Yeah, we got to get Ginger Rogers in there somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, just another word on this, because I I hear what you're saying. I relate to what you're saying uh, at a deep level. I mean, uh, I feel like I'm on a mission and I want my soulmate to be on the same mission with me. You know what I mean? I want to know that she's got my back, that she's rooting for me, that she's following my play and that she's cheering me on. And I don't always feel that and I miss it. Uh, you know, I, I do. The other ha- side of that though, is there's a built in uh, kind of uh, critic that has got me always questioning myself. And maybe a cheerleader would be bad for a guy like me. Maybe that would uh, not, I, I lose my governing mechanism and I tend to go a little bit overboard because, because I get reinforcements to my worst tendencies of ranting, you know, wild eyed uh, rage, you know, at uh, the machine of uh, uh, third wave anti-racism as you put it in your book of wokeness. And, and I, I lose touch. I mean, for example, let me give you just one example. I know this is your question, but oh no, it was my question. Sure. <laughs> Okay, so I could do this, um, uh, which was that, uh, you know, I think the universities are going to hell in a handbasket under the management of the anti-racist brigades uh, of the diversity and inclusion uh, structures of the students who are demanding social justice be demonstrated and uh, moral righteousness be signaled with with every action in the university. The people who are uh, raging against the colonial imposition of the Western canon uh, in the curriculum, uh, et cetera. Uh, here at Brown, there's now a petition circulating among students to reinstate a required course. Brown is famous for having an open curriculum where there are no requirements. And that's a matter of principle of a kind of pedagogic ideological stand. There are no requirements. Students make up their own program here at Brown with the guidance and input of the professors, but there are no requirements. Different departments may have requirements for meeting their concentration standards, but there are no university requirements. They've talked about imposing the requirement of people taking an anti-racism course universally uh, of people who matriculate here at Brown. And, uh, you know, I'm against it. I'm strenuously against it. Uh, and, you know, I'm a prominent person in the, uh, in the political life of the community. And, you know, I'm thinking about writing a piece. And my wife is counseling me against it. Don't stick your neck out like that. Don't, don't stand in opposition to the students and whatnot. And I'm saying, you know, these kids, uh, they, they don't know what the hell they're doing. And they're, you know, in the, there's no uh, parental supervision because, you know, my colleagues won't stand up for any principal and whatnot. And she says, I had told her about a letter that I received from Alden Morris. Alden Morris is a very distinguished sociologist at Northwestern University, an African-American who's written a book about the origins of the civil rights movement that was published, I think, in the 1980s. And anyway, it's a classic. It's a classic study of the civil rights movement, Alden Morris. And he and I attended the same community college in 1969, John, when Mm -hmm. you were four years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) We attended the same community college as, as, you know, black kids kind of intellectual coming up on the South side, you know, uh, not quite doing as well as we might've been doing. And we needed some place to go and, you know, take some classes. He and I attended to say, he's now tenure professor, very distinguished. I'm sure he has a chair at Northwestern, Northwestern in sociology, still lives in Chicago. I am who I am. And uh, Alden wrote me a letter during the height of the post Ferguson turmoil, when I was also on a tear about the students being off base about Black Lives Matter being not what you want to say. And he counseled me to remember my roots. And I had told my wife, Lawan about this letter uh, when we were dating years ago. And she reminded me of it. And she made me go and get it out. And she made me read it. Read what Alden Morris wrote to you. He reminded you of your roots. He reminded you that you were once one of these kids running around on the college campus with your head full of all ideas and whatnot. He told you that as a senior member of the community, They look to you for leadership. 
that you had to have patience, that you needed to help them, not just scold them. Keep that in mind, says Lawan, reminding me of what my uh, colleague uh, in black academia and my fellow Chicagoan from the same post Second World War baby boom generation had to say to me, keep your feet on the ground, Glenn. Don't forget where you came from, Glenn. Don't forget your uncle Alfred saying to you, was this is Lawan saying to you once, we could only send one to Harvard and MIT and all of that. We sent you and we don't see us in anything you do. This is what my uncle said to me on one occasion. Lawan knows about this because I've shared it with her. She's kind of my conscience in a way. You're still a black man from the south side of Chicago. Don't you ever forget that. That's not nothing. It's not an answer to the question of what to do about affirmative action and what to say about George Floyd riots, but it's not nothing. Mm -mm. It isn't. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if I should go here. My ex was white. And um, I think to myself, it'd be interesting because I, I don't want to cheer. You know, I don't want somebody who doesn't get me, but I would want somebody who was also a constructive critic, too. And it's occurred to me that if that were a black woman, she would do it particularly well. There are all sorts of nuances that she would get. There are all sorts of resonances and you know, historical aspects of it. She would be the best person for that. But unfortunately, and this I shouldn't say this publicly, but you know what? Life is short. Unfortunately, so many educated black women find views like yours and mine repulsive that the pool is narrowed. It's not impossible. There are educated women who could deal with deal with this, so to speak. But I hope great, I'm married to one of them. Yeah. But for a great many, it would, you know, somebody like me would seem to, you know, deracialize, you know, doesn't like his own people. I mean, it's in many fields, it's the heart of education to be taught this particular kind of hyper woke ideology. And so it's hard for me to say where that's going to go. And I want to reiterate, I'm not saying that there are no black women who understand the way somebody like me thinks there are plenty. That's why I say these things in the public. Nevertheless, in the circles that you know you and me travel in, it can be hard to find that woman. So it's interesting. I wouldn't mind having that counselor because most white women through no fault of their own probably couldn't do it as well as the one nevertheless life is complicated so yeah 